A central theme sprinkled throughout the Adventure Time episode I Am a Sword is the relationship between people and objects. This is predominantly explored by building on the relationship between Finn and his sword, which is also Finn, but the topic is alluded to in many scenes. I mean, check this out, Jake refers to replacement of tools. We can find you a new sword, we do that all the time. Finn expresses that the sword is special. That sword is like me. Jake compares himself to a pooper scooper to get an idea across. I don't think I'm totally scooping what you're pooping. Bandit Princess role plays with her coins. Now kiss. Mwah. And Badfoot Money affectionately refers to his bags of cash as pals. Gotta go get these muchachos in a bank. And all those object laden interactions occurred in less than 45 seconds. The word object at its broadest definitions can encapsulate practically anything. Inanimate object is more specific, and that modifier is almost always presupposed in common vernacular. The word object carries a lot of baggage. Seeing a person as an object is typically regarded negatively as stripping that person of their autonomy and individuality. Alternatively, people often refer to inanimate objects in ways that grants them personality and even personhood. I'm gonna dissect I Am A Sword to see how the episode plays with these sorts of concepts and many more. Some of the interactions are fun inclusions that simply contribute to the running motif without packing too much depth beyond the surface, but others make for interesting multi-layered discussion. The most depth is packed into the interaction between a person and that same person who's been literally dehumanized. I'm obviously referring to Finn and Finnsword, and the episode starts with Finn disregarding the desires of his blade and threatening its well-being in the process. Finn knows that Finnsword is also Finn, he was there when that happened, and he also directly interacts with Finnsword and gets feedback that he actually acknowledges, at least the first time around. Should we stay out a little longer? Should we do a sword trick? Is that a better idea? Up until this episode, I had been wondering just how much of Finn's human mind is expressed when he exists as a sword. Basically, I was wondering what level of cognition does this object have? All past interactions between Finn and Finn's sword were framed in a way that made it seem like we were witnessing Finn's own reflection. Human Finn's face was always out of the shot, which made the gag of Finn talking to himself be deliberately unclear. Was human Finn making the gestures one might do to a mirror in the mountain? Was he giving himself a pep talk in Dentist? And did he merely repeat himself in Crossover? The episode I Am A Sword provides absolute undeniable confirmation that no, Finn Sword was actually the one responding all those times. Finn Sword is fully sentient and its mind, or rather I should say his mind, is pure unadulterated Finn. And yet, Finnsword is way more no-nonsense than regular Finn when it comes to reckless behavior. I don't think it's simply because Finnsword is the thing being thrown, since Finn throws himself into danger for fun all the time. Need I remind you of the most extreme example? Yeah, it feels good! Love it! Loving that heal! Let's go! Oh yeah, give it to me! So why the lack of reckless abandon so often exhibited by the human Finn? I guess life as a sword changes a person. Just as Human Finn has grown and developed since the episode Is That You, Finn Sword has also mentally grown and developed. But Finn Sword is delegated to life as an onlooker. The title card and later events within the episode portray this existence as duplicate Finn being trapped within the sword, playing the role of an inactive observer. And for whatever reason, Finn Sword chose to be a silent observer at that rarely ever altering the course of events his duplicate experienced until this episode. Shaping your own actions, living through your own mistakes and blunders, that is quite different from being a bystander to somebody else doing all of this in your stead. This stark difference in environment, being the player versus being the observer, would no doubt lead these two characters, which were once nearly identical, taking somewhat different directions in their views and outlook on the world, exemplified by the two disagreeing on whether sweet sword tricks should be done atop a rickety bridge. Actually, I'd say what happens is even worse than merely disagreeing, because Finn never values the input of Finn Sword in the first place, only paying attention to Jake instead. Finn doesn't even internalize Finn Sword's responses, just assuming they would be positive ones. 
Finn disregards the sword because it's hard to properly visualize an object as a conscious individual, and because the sword is not speaking to him, it's not expressing its autonomy in a way that's noticeable for the given situation. It reminds me a bit of when really shy people have a hard time speaking up in large groups, which can lead to them being forgotten about entirely in the long term. They become externalized and, in a sense, may lose their sense of self because their individuality could never be expressed in the first place. It also reminds me of dialogue from the film Ghost in the Shell Innocence, which I've seen attributed to Saito Ryoku. We weep for the blood of a bird, but not for the blood of a fish. Blessed are those with a voice. The dynamic is made more complicated, however, by the fact that Finsword can talk, but makes the conscious choice not to until he feels there's absolutely no other choice. Stop! Ah! A talking sword? Even Jake was left out of the loop due to Finsword keeping it on the down low to such an extent. Uh, swords don't talk. Despite the fact that Jake was in the vicinity when Finsword became a thing, to go on a quick tangent about Jake, his past actions provide an interesting contrast to Finsword's behavior. In the episode Jake the Brick, when Jake becomes an object, though granted this was something he desired to do at the time, all he wanted to do was converse to escape his boredom. I guess I should head back. Oh, really? So soon? Jake ended up narrating the events of the world around him non-stop during his time as a brick, whereas Finsword wanted to keep conversation to an absolute minimum. We can only make speculations about the reasons behind Finsword's seemingly bizarre choice. Maybe he first stayed silent from the shock of unknowingly having his human form sacrificed to enact Plan B, before realizing that, yeah, it was for the best, and after further contemplation, decided that constantly interfering with the other Finn's life would create an awkward and strange situation. Maybe Finn sort chose to carry the burden of being just an object for the purpose of Finn's life continuing, for the most part, as is. Maybe Finn sort is making a sacrifice here, he's keeping the status quo, by staying an object. This is all mere speculation because when it comes to Finn Sword, we don't really have much to work with. Perhaps Grass Finn in Season 8 of Adventure Time will shed more clues on the mindset of Finn Sword, but for now, your guess is as good as mine. I do want to stress, though, that this wasn't just an oversight on the part of the creators. The episode I Am a Sword could have easily been rewritten in a way such that Finn Sword could only be heard by Finn and barely anything would change. It would not have made sense for Jake to have heard Finn Sword in Crossover. That's me. I heard you the first time. But since these episodes are close together in the same season, that bit could have easily been scrapped in production if necessary. Finn Sword choosing not to talk was a deliberate choice on behalf of the creators. I think it's incredibly unlikely for that to be just an afterthought. Finn number one did not just become an object. He also chose to objectify himself. The philosopher Martha Nussbaum classified objectification into seven varieties, and they all tie into this episode. If you combine the scene on the bridge and the following scene in the valley, Finsword had five of these seven properties applied to him. The other two properties are applied to him later in the episode by Bandit Princess. Instrumentality Finsword is a sword, he is literally a tool. The insult, you're a tool, should come to mind here. It usually refers to somebody lacking the intelligence or self-esteem to know they're being used. But unfortunately for Finsword, his association with being a tool is impossible to remove because his physical form is that. He's used as a sword because he is one. Denial of autonomy and inertness. These happen concurrently when Finn disregards and ignores the will of the Finn Sword. I've already discussed this interaction at length. Fungibility. Jake has not one, but two lines of dialogue that demonstrate he thinks Finn Sword is interchangeable. Come on, we can find you a new sword. We do that all the time. I'll make you a new sword that looks like you. We got a bun ton of arts and crafts stuff lying around at the house. Violability. Bandit Princess wants to make Finsword suffer by using him to commit evil deeds. She in no uncertain terms wants to defile him and mentally debase and break him. And I'll keep trashing it over and over and over until you can't remember ever having done a good deed in your life. She also views lives as disposable in general, and derives unadulterated glee from breaking bodies. I'll be cutting and breaking you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Ownership. Finn Sword clearly belongs to Finn. That much is obvious. I do have to give props to not only Finn, but surprisingly Bandit Princess too, because they don't say my sword at all in this episode, rather always calling the sword by its name. The one exception is when Bandit Princess is forced to relinquish ownership of the Finn Sword. Keep your busted sword! 
which ties in nicely to that ownership property of objectification. To go off on a quick tangent while I'm on the topic of names, it's not all lollipops and rainbows here. It's very much worth mentioning how the naming convention is only Finn number one and Finn number two from the perspective of Finsword. Finn number two, if you can hear me. Finsword also identifies himself to Bandit Princess as Finn Mertens, with Finsword being a pseudonym. Yeah, I'm Finn Mertens. AKA Finn Sword. And yet, rather than just calling him Finn, as it's safe to say Bandit Princess has never met the human Finn Mertens before anyway, she opts to call him Finn Sword. Even we as the audience have internalized that Finn Sword is the name for Finn number one. I mean, I've been referring to him as Finn Sword this entire video. And in the name Finn Sword, the word Finn is used as an adjective. Finn is being used as a descriptor for what kind of sword it is. The sword is the primary identity of this person, or at least the primary identifier. It's not even Sword Finn, it's Finn Sword. That's interesting, and rather messed up when you think about it. Hell, in my own breakdown of the opening to the Allens miniseries, I refer to the merged Finn Sword and Grass Sword as Grass Finn, as if he's a person again now when he wasn't before, despite in actuality still being a person in this form. Naming conventions reflect a lot about how people or objects are viewed, perceived, and also treated. Now, back to the list. Number seven is denial of subjectivity. Bandit Princess clearly shows no concern for Finn's feelings or worldview, or anyone's for that matter. It's gonna be hilarious to watch you cry, Finn Sword. Cry as you end lives and steal from the weak. In addition to Nussbaum's list of seven properties, Ray Langton proposed an additional three, and all these apply to Finn Sword too. Reduction to body and to appearance, these are once again a priori properties of Finn Sword because his body is literally that of an object. Silencing, Finn Sword chose to objectify himself in this manner, as I had discussed previously. Before moving away from objectification, I want to briefly talk about BMO, since BMO is also a sentient object, but is nearly always treated as possessing full personhood. However, the line where a machine becomes a person is its own giant can of worms, and just go watch Ghost in the Shell standalone complex rather than having me start a discussion about that topic. All I want to do is draw attention to the fact that when BMO is used as a game console, he is incapable of interaction as we saw in the episode Flute Spell. I cannot talk and run this game at the same time. The same thing happens in this episode. When BMO is running a game for Finn to play, he becomes a stationary device incapable of speech without quitting the game first. BMO is objectified when he's being used. It's a continued application of Adventure Time making the figurative be very literal. Alright, now let's move to some other stuff. One can be equated with an object in manners that don't qualify as objectification. The simplest example would be using metaphors for descriptive purposes. Jake provides one such example when responding to Finn. I don't think I'm totally scooping what you're pooping. He refers to himself as a pooper scooper. I especially love this line because despite Jake equating himself to something that is used for shoveling crap, there's not a single shred of negative connotations applied. There's no value judgment tagging along with a statement at all. Jake is just saying he doesn't understand Finn's frame of mind, but in a very quirky and fun way. Another instance happens when Finn Sword is being tormented by Bandit Princess. This gray area wet wipe is using me against my will. By calling her a gray area wet wipe, Finn is describing Bandit Princess as somebody who makes the line between good and bad seem crystal clear due to how despicable she is. Unlike the example with Jake, this metaphor packs a highly negative connotation. It's pretty amazing what range of things can be accomplished in language when intermingling people with objects. Then there's the topic of object-based identity. Finn could have had a fight with practically anybody after the loss of Finn's sword, but to keep the theme of relationships between people and objects going, it made the most sense to bring back Science Cat and his new partner Spear Bear, since Sword Shark died a while ago. Science Cat and Spear Bear are characters that are identified via their associated objects, to the point that they are named after them. While science is a bit abstract, the lab coat and glasses are the defining features of Science Cat, whereas Spear Bear's identity is even more strictly rooted, to the point that he even has a spearhead tattooed on his belly. These two characters are signified by objects, and those objects compose their primary identities. 
This concept also applies to attire, to clothing, and it's often common for fictional characters to wear the exact same outfits all the time, because those outfits become iconic and defining traits of the character. We often associate a character with their getup. Ah! Do you ever take those off? This is taken to an even further extreme by having the Box Kingdom we saw in the fifth season make a comeback. In the Box Kingdom, the object is the identity, straight up. The individual cats are not seen as people. The boxes themselves are the people in this bizarre society. Identity is tied to the box, not to the cat wearing it. That is, of course, until disorder sets in and any semblance of an established society falls apart. When the cats aren't in boxes, the entire validity of the kingdom falls into question. Bandit Princess kills Box Prince by thrusting Finsword through the carton, because the death of the box represents the death of that individual. I've read that some people think showing just the box was a way to censor that Bandit Princess killed an actual cat, but that's ignoring how the dynamics of the Box Kingdom society work. The event is horrific to these cats because killing a box is equivalent to killing a person, and in this case, that person was the prince. Box Kingdom is somewhat of an allegory for actual monarchies. It's taking the concept to an absurd and amusing extreme. While the monarch wears a physical crown, the crown as a phrase is often used as a metonymy where it refers to the monarchy as a whole rather than to any specific individual. And in some scenarios, donning the crown can, at least to an extent, erase the individual wearing it. I'll just play a clip from the trailer for the show The Crown to illustrate this. I have seen three great monarchies brought down through their failure to separate personal indulgences from duty. The crown must win. Now to finally flip the script a bit. The episode I Am A Sword also has cases where an object is personified and given a sense of individuality. Bandit Princess talks to her coins as she roleplays with them. That's that good, good. Now kiss! Mwah. She's personifying inanimate objects so she can derive entertainment from exerting control over them. She gets super gleeful when she realizes she can exert control over an actual person, Finsword, but prior to that, she had to settle for objects. For somebody as vile and ruthless as Bandit Princess, it's no surprise that she views people and objects as essentially the same thing. She anthropomorphizes inanimate objects, but reduces living beings to merely her own playthings. She's basically equating everything into one lump, and that lump is something that she thinks she can do whatever she wants with. Badfoot Money also personifies his cash. Probably because I'm carrying around these succulent money bags. Gotta go get these muchachos in a bank. Obviously, he loves money, and his coins are his dear, lovable, and juicy friends. He elevates legal tender into something he has a personal bond with. This love of money is continued with Sharon, who first reports the stolen gold to Finn and Jake, and then after that tells them that her husband got beheaded. Sharon clearly values the gold over her husband. We'll get your husband's head, Sharon. And the gold, please. The two do have a mutual understanding that gold is what matters most, though. Oh shoot! Don't forget to bring back my gold! Dag! Sharon's gonna be real upset. So I guess their relationship is functional, though probably not at all healthy, since Mira Cameron is dehumanized in it. Finn also personifies an inanimate object by speaking to it as if he's holding a conversation. Talking to inanimate object. Get a load of this guy. Bimo's humorous quip reminds me how it can be amusing when people publicly treat objects as if they're alive, but we've all done this at some point in our life. Whether it's yelling angrily at a computer that's freezing, or a vending machine that stole your money, or whispering sweet nothings to your car and hope that the engine turns over, or yelling at that uncooperative car when it fails to do so, interacting with inanimate objects as if they're capable of response is quite a common occurrence. I think it's interesting that Finn talks to the makeshift Finsword as if he's talking to his own reflection. Even the dialogue alone reminded me of a scene in the episode Don't Look. Am I uncaring? Judgmental? Did I take Finsword for granted? Maybe I take a lot of people in my life for granted, you know? It's no secret that people often talk to their reflections in the mirror, and films portray this a lot as well. While the mirror is an object, and thus so is our reflection technically, we impart ourselves onto our own reflection, and sometimes even talk to ourselves from the second person perspective, as if somebody else is giving us a pep talk. 
All right, man, no more procrastinating. Even if you got a cold, you gotta finish this flippin' video already. You got this. And now I want to reference back to the start of the episode. Contrary to personifying your own reflection, Finn's treatment of Finsword at the start of the episode was the exact opposite. He acted as if the sword was just mirroring his own wishes, when it actually wasn't. I think it's just a neat juxtaposition. We sometimes treat what we see in the mirror as a different person, but Finn treats an actual different person as if it was merely a mirror. After Finn spent time lamenting and fretting over the loss of Finsword, you'd think he'd treat it as a fully-fledged person, but after confronting Bandit Princess, Finn declares that he alone will settle this conflict without Jake's help. Jake, no matter what happens, don't step in. Finn got carried away and turned the confrontation into a matter of misguided honor, which I don't think he would have done if a hostage that wasn't an object was involved. The primary objective would normally be for Finn and Jake to rescue the hostage at all costs as quickly as possible. Yet because Finsword is a sword, Finn foolishly puts his pride on the line, and Finsword is the one who has to bear the brunt of that mistake. The episode ends with Bimo placing an accurate sticker onto the broken Finn sword. The sticker creates more comfort and reassurance, despite the situation remaining unchanged, because perception is heavily tied into feelings. And as the episode concludes with the eerie green glow, there's a sense that Finn himself is being affected in some way, that it's the Finn we know who's being corrupted or influenced, compared to just having the cracked lens there when the glow occurs. It lacks the same impact. A simple sticker can do a whole lot. You've finally reached the end of my analysis video. I hope my musings were interesting and provided food for thought. If you'd like more discussion on this episode, check out my review of I Am A Sword, or if you're interested, other Adventure Time reviews I've done. Now I'm gonna go get some air. I like air.